Let's begin. I am so, so, so excited to be able to read this book in community, partially because vulnerability and shame work is something that seems like we all have had to reckon with given a pandemic lifestyle and the space in which it puts you in order to examine your life and sort of see like, you know, how, how do you survive in times of crisis, right? That's often when our vulnerable selves our sense of shame, all of that comes to surface. So I am really honored to be able to speak about things that may be vulnerable. And I want to begin our conversation by naming that if any, I don't want anyone, Ron nor myself, want anyone to sit in any sense of discomfort, right? And this is a space of community. Sure, it's an academic space. It's an intelligent space, but it also names an emotional intelligence. We are people, right? Before scholars, we're community. We're in family, you know, I I end our sessions, if you don't know, by naming like, oh, I love you so much. And people are like, girl, you don't know me. But I'm clear, like there's a lot of love in this space. And we're gonna talk about some things perhaps, or themes and topics may come up that is gonna, it's necessary for us in community to be able to trust each other and to be in a space of vulnerability or else the book club won't work, you know? Cause y'all know I'll share my life, but who wants to hear all that? Like, I wanna be in conversation with y'all. So I'm asking, and naming for us to be able to bring that sense of ourselves as we deep into this work. And I wanna know how does that feel for folks? And you could, you could give me a like, I'll think about it. You can give me a thumbs up. You could be like, stop. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. So let's all keep ourselves grounded in that. Thank you so much. Oh, wow, in this version, I have a new computer, so I didn't see that this version of Zoom you can get emojis. This is amazing. Okay, Hi. So <clears throat> I'm also coming down with a cold, a regular cold, not a scary cold. So pardon me. Um, I wanna share my screen with y'all actually, because before we even get into any sense of reading, I wanted to ground us sort of in the why. Why did Brene Brown and Tarana come together? And I think some of that is in the book already, right? But it was, I found a little snippet from a podcast in which they were able to talk to each other. And it's only five minutes long. So you'll hear someone else beside me, which is lovely, right? So we're gonna give a screen share. Let me show that I'm a competent millennial. Uh Okay. Oh no. You can do it. <laughs> I really appreciate you, Susan. All right, in the interim. So we can maybe Ron, you have to give her access. No, he definitely has. Yeah. I mean we can get started. Um I can just send you the link, Ron. Yeah. Yeah, here we go. Ron to the rescue. What's a competent millennial without an actual adult? <laughs> Ron for president. <laughs> um, do, I, but we can't get started in naming. Does anyone, has anyone heard of Tarana Burke before? Tarana Burke or Brene Brown? And if you're willing to unmute yourself and just give us a little quick synopsis of who you understand them to be. That'd be lovely to share with the group. It could be anyone, go ahead, just feel free. On the, on the cusp of her fame, Tarana Burke actually spoke in the Bronx at, um, at um, Bronx Native Shop. The Bronx Native Shop, if you're not familiar, is about 10 feet by 10 feet. And uh, there might've been a hundred people in there and I got a, the opportunity to hear her speak. Um, and it, it was quite powerful. Uh, sure, I mean, she was well known then, the Me Too movement had already started, uh, but shortly after that, it really accelerated. Uh, you know, you started really hearing about her name and, and her cause and her efforts, uh, but also her personal history. Um, and it feels like a lot of that is sort of encapsulated in this book where she went through a lot as a young person. And, um, you know, the first story about with Jason Reynolds was, um, 
you know, pretty Jason, Jason's story and um, well, actually all the stories, but Jason and, and Kesey Layman's stories uh, were quite interesting to me. Is this working? It is working. Awesome. Um, we could, I can, we could also have time real quick to hear from someone else. Is anyone else familiar with their work? I've read a few of Brene Brown's books and okay. I heard about Tarana Burke when she was going through what she was going through. Absolutely. So yeah, Tarana Burke and Brene Brown are both advocates in their own right with Brene Brown being a professor at various universities doing work around vulnerability and shame. And Tarana Burke, I think particularly if you're from the Bronx, you're familiar with her work and there's a pride. I'm gonna do one quick, very shameful story. It's not that shameful. My 29th birthday, I went to go see Harry Potter, uh, the musical, because I'm a Potterhead. And I went to, the, I was sitting at a restaurant with my two best friends at a really just a uh, delicious Chinese restaurant on 42nd. And I look at a table behind me and Barana Burke is at the table with her friends. And I'm not the type of person to ever go up to anyone but we both went to the bathroom at the same time and I went, oh, a birthday gift. And I thanked her for her work. So whenever I, as beside, aside from her work that she's done, I want to name that I sh like, she was very humble and lovely in that moment. And she seemed like, just like a lovely person. So I was excited to be able to read it. All right, story of shame over, here we go. I want us to be able to listen. I want us to take a listen and some guiding questions to give yourself as we're listening are, you know, she speak, She says this one phrase around stewardship. And she says, I believe good stewardship takes the both of us. And I just want you to think to, your, to yourselves as they're talking, like, what is stewardship in this sense? What does that look like? Um, here we go. Bye. From my side, admittedly, I'd probably do anything you asked me to do, but the timing was bigger than us. I had really been grappling over the last couple of years with trying to figure out how to be more inclusive, how to present the work in a way that invited more people to see themselves. You know, the last thing I ever wanted to do was put work in the world around shame, vulnerability, and courage, then make people feel like they had to do something extra to find themselves in it. You know, I thought I had control for that with my sample because I've always been hyper vigilant about diversity in the people I interview and in the data sources. In fact, one of the earliest criticisms of my work was that the sample population actually over indexed around black women and Latinx folks. But I started to get comments, um, especially from black women and men. Comments like, you know, I'm having to work at this more to see myself in it more than I would have preferred or more than I would have liked to have to do. Finally, it was the combination of a conversation with you and a conversation with Austin Channing Brown on her TV show, where I thought the problem isn't the research. The research resonates with a diverse group of people because it's based on a diverse sample. But the way I present my research to the world does not always resonate because I often use myself and my stories as examples. And I have a very privileged white experience. That was a huge aha for me. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, one of the things that struck me was in the gifts of imperfection, there's a scene where I'm in sweats and I have dirty hair and I'm running up the Nordstrom escalator with my daughter to exchange some shoes that her grandmother bought her. Immediately I'm overwhelmed because I look and feel like shit and there's all these perfect looking people giving me the side eye. And just as I start to go into shame, a pop song starts playing and Ellen breaks out into the robot. And I mean, full on, unfiltered, unaware, just sheer joy. And as the perfect people start staring at her, I'm reduced to this moment where I have to decide Am I going to betray her and roll my eyes and say, you know, Ellen, geez, settle down. Or am I going to just let her do her thing and be joyful and unashamed? You know, I end up choosing her and actually dancing with her. And it's a, it's a great story about choosing my daughter over acceptance by strangers. But I've shopped enough with Black friends to know that if I was not dressed up, even if I, even if I was dressed up, 
and I was in a department store where my black daughter broke into a dance, there would be a whole other set of variables to consider, including being hassled by security, possibly separated from my daughter, even arrested. So when you asked me if we could focus the work through the lens of the Black experience, it was a hell yes for me. I want to figure out how to better serve. In addition to telling my story, which I think is helpful, I want to co-create so people see themselves in the work. Co-creation is how we can tell stories from the Black experience that illustrate the data. I mean, does that make sense to you? It does. This is our first time really digging into your grappling with this. Your questions make absolute sense, and it also makes sense why you wanted to do this together. You still said, are you sure you want me to do it with you? You have my permission to use my work and do it. I know. I was scared. I'm still scared. No, I get it. I understand the fear. And I know we have to be prepared for the question about you being the editor of a book about Black experience, but there's nobody I trust more particularly on these topics, who has studied them more and who cares more. It's not just the research piece. There are other people who study these topics, but you can combine the research expertise with compassion. You are, this sounds really corny, an embodiment of your work, of the research, of the knowledge. I think it takes the eye of somebody who has done this level of research you have done and who cares about other people's stories. I feel such a sense of responsibility and protectiveness about the stories we've asked people to share for this anthology. We have to be good stewards of this information. So I definitely get the fear and reluctance, but I believe good stewardship takes both of us. I know as we read these powerful essays, we both took turns feeling a little overwhelmed with the responsibility of protecting them. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I've been doing this work for 25 years now. I know the stories in this book can change, even save people's lives. It's an honor to do this with you, honestly. I've been a shame and vulnerability researcher for a long time, but not any long. Thank you all so much. And I'd love to hear some initial, maybe just initial thoughts and perhaps the answer to my question is, what does stewardship look like in this? But what are some thoughts that folks are having? I like that she <clears throat> acknowledged the kind of the power that she has as a white woman, you know, in um in editing these stories, right? And even like facilitating this whole conversation, because I think that that's important that like, you know, um, when we share our stories that um, we don't see it through like that white gaze, you know? Absolutely. And, and you're naming that like, she acknowledged that she's saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what else? And I wanted to add going off of that. I really appreciated that Tarana Burke went in on that question, right? That it wasn't. And because I think that discussion was also referenced in the intro and so that it wasn't an afterthought that she was like, oh, I want, I like Renee, so let her do it. But that, that she also was like, how can I steward this novel? I mean, this book to the best of my ability and what does that look like? And so it also speaking about it, not feeling like the white gaze, like I felt Tarana's power in, um, as an editor of this, because when I initially heard about the book and I saw Renee Brown's, who I like actually, but I was a little like, who, why, why would you have? this woman on a black experience. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I read the intro that I felt like, okay, I can, I can stay with it because of how Tarana talked about it. Right. And, and, and alluding to a co-creation, but it's actually something much stronger than that. It's this idea that like with the resources, with this white woman's sense of resources, this black woman can then steward stories that are necessary for all of us, which co-creation is important, but it sort of reverses this idea that we need to work together. Like sometimes we need to be in service of, you know, and I, and I, I feel like that's what you're touching upon. So thank you so much. Whoa, gems out the gate, everyone. What else? What else is standing out? And what stewardship? Come on, I know there's like a hundred geniuses in here. I'm glad she chose her daughter over the strangers to be kind to her daughter. That, that was really nice. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, definitely naming. And you're always the, the voice to name that. 
we're paying attention to how people are moving with their children. Therefore, how open are they to actually navigating their actual life? So thank you. I always appreciate that. Yes. It, it also felt kind of risky for her to, for her, for Tawana Burke to choose Brene Brown <clears throat> as a co-writer for this book. I mean, I'm sure there are other Black scholars or Black people who are doing that kind of work that she could have chosen. And in choosing Brene, and Brene brings a wealth of experience and history, it is almost as though from the very beginning of the book, she is saying this is not a Black issue. That, you know, what's, what's in this, I, I'm not sure if all the writers are Black, but um, the issues that they are discussing and dealing with may, in some cases, even transcend race. So. Well, I have the book and I'm looking at the back cover and I think all of the people in the book, their pictures are depicted on the back of the cover. Oh, okay. and they, they all look quite, quite <laughs> black to me. Quite black to me, AJ says. There you go. <laughs> you better say it, you better say it, EJ. But I, oh, I want to name- They all look black to me. But okay, quite black to me. But so I want to name- the there, there is a, in, in the idea of shame and vulnerability, yes, show, you better show it to us. Thank <laughs> you. Yes, it's oh. um, all right. In the idea- All right, of, y'all. Okay, <laughs> all right, y'all, let's, like, let's lean up on Ron. But in the idea of vulnerability and shame, I think that itself is universal, right? So what, so, so it's not completely off what you're naming at all. Like that idea itself is universal. And the intention of this work is to put it in the black lens, put it in a black story, put it in a black experience for black body to be able to use the resource within themselves. Not, not in a black lens so white people can be informed necessarily, but in a black lens so that black bodies can be in use of it. Again, in service to, which is something that's gonna come up a lot as we go through these um, stories. And definitely, it is definitely interesting, Barbara, I'm just reading your quote on, on uh, reading what you've put in the chat, which is curious on what this book would look like if Brene Brown wasn't co-author. Absolutely. And I wonder if by the end, there's a name to that. Right, like I wonder if any of the essays name and speak to that question. So that's a great thing to guide. I almost see it as, we often forget the literary space is also an artist space. Unless it's a piece of poetry and unless it's like this specific format of art, we forget often because it's scholarly, it's based in academia, right? You're gonna hear me dismantle, try to dismantle all of these notions, but literary, Literature itself is an art, literary art, right? Like that is, that is a term. And I would like to believe that no matter where an author ends up in life, they probably start off seeing themselves in that, right? Whether you go into journalism or whatever you choose, but that artistry is there. So I kind of almost see it as when an artist, like a music artist would work with a producer, right? Maybe a white producer or maybe someone that's not, that doesn't identify with them on an art and naming something and creating this tool and creating this resource for the world. So I'm not saying that Brene Brown is like Jay-Z and Tarana's Beyonce and they're coming together and making album of the year, but I am naming that there is an artistry there. And I think there's a freedom sometimes that we don't put on authors that we put on other people who create and produce media content. So I'm just, you know, it's sticking out to me. So anything else around this conversation? I think I've read Brene Brown's, um, one of her books before, I don't remember which one, but you know, talk about like shame and guilt and resilience. And um, even in listening to it, I found my face like, um, cause I did like the audible, um, like twisted up when I was listening to it because just because I felt like, I understand what she's saying to a certain extent as far as like shame and it being universal, but not being able to really identify with her experience because, you know, um, she is a white woman in this. Absolutely. 
because we cool. yep go ahead paula uh, well i was just the uh she they talk about that in the introduction sort of where the video stopped going um on my kindle it's page 17 of the introduction. Mm -hmm. Tarana says, my lived experience told me that the entire idea and experience of vulnerability feels like a very dangerous place to play, an unsafe thing to even consider or to think about as a black person in this country. As I read your work about vulnerability being the foundation of courage and the birthplace of love and joy and trust, that there are these the places that didn't fit. I was forced to contort myself as just what you just said and to try to understand my reaction of, oh no, Vulnerability means something very different to me. And I'm, I'm really struck by how much that's what they're addressing in, in that partnership. And I'm really struck by your question, Paula, of what would have been like if, if, if um, Renee Brown weren't one of the co-editors. This is something they're going after for a reason. And it's just, um, but that lack of fit is really foregrounded. It's interesting. For sure, yeah, and I want to name that was that was Barbara's uh, thought and question, but yeah, exactly right. Like naming that, um, would that conversation of vulnerability even be happening in a certain level if having not to confront something that completely tells you you shouldn't be vulnerable with, right? Which is like this white woman's way of surviving versus this black woman's way of survival. So I want to name that. That's perfect. Um, Greg, I know you were going to say something. Yeah, just real quick, I also answering Barbara's question, I would think uh, it's less likely that Brene Brown would be getting cited if she wasn't a co-editor, because we've read five sections and two of the authors have already cited her work. I feel like that really jumped out at me. I feel like that wouldn't happen if it wasn't her involvement. That's just an observation. For sure. For sure. I was kind of like, okay, we're driving it here. I get it. She's in the car. She's part of the story. Yeah, I felt that. Good point, Greg. Um, anything else? I just wanted to note. Hi, everybody. I'm Tiffany. Um, Hi. So I like Brene Brown, and it's interesting that everybody's coming for her. Just a little bit, just a little bit. But um, when she cited her example of choosing her daughter, I was like, is that really a big issue to, to cite in the book? I was like, is it a big deal if you see a mom dancing with her kid at the store? I was like, it's not that dramatic. Obviously, if you're with your kid and music is playing and you're dancing, I just didn't see where that was a huge issue that she could have used to make her point about being like a privileged white woman with her child. I thought maybe that in itself seemed to be a privileged example. So, um, but I like Brene, so I'm curious to see what else um, she discovers it you know amongst herself with the with the book so yeah and I, I and I just want to name I don't know if it's shade I don't know if it's shade I think I think it's a healthy I don't think it's I don't I want to name I don't know if it's receiving a shade more as like we're addressing the major elephant in the room which is like the black experience with this white woman's involvement you know what I mean because I think I think um to your point you know her work is like helpful. It's very, mm -hmm. very helpful in the world and it makes sense. And I also want to name, there's a sense of hearing you say it aloud because I actually felt exactly the same way when I was reading it. I was like, this white woman did not take her baby girl dancing talking about, but then as, as I hear you speak aloud, I think it connects for me that her work is rooted in vulnerability and rooted in shame, right? Like that's her social work. That's what she gets paid for to talk at a collegiate level and otherwise, right? So I think she's citing that as she's going through her own sense of shame, putting that on her daughter and then saying, wow, I'm over here having this existential crisis about my baby dancing. Meanwhile, Black people are literally afraid for their life. I think she's, she's naming a little bit how minute and if, if, that's, if it's something that small that's going to make her say, you know what, I need to do this work, you know, maybe, and, I, and for me, now I'm in the space of like, maybe it doesn't always take that big thing. You know what I mean? In order for not only for us to be in a space, but for allyship to occur. Cause me in a non-white body, I don't often think about what that space takes like, I, at least for me, I'm not sitting here thinking around what's it gonna look like for people to have to become allies for me. So 
just to kind of hear her talk about it, I was kind of like, oh, wow, that's interesting. It took something that small, huh? Meanwhile, well, you know, it's, it's, both are dying. Yeah, but I, I think Brene Brown in her work, she, she focuses on the global. She focuses on the global of, of shame and vulnerability. In this book, the two of them have to, and the writers are reckoning with the additional layer of shame and vulnerability that are put on people of color. We all suffer from the global. Oh. And as for her dancing in the store, okay. I could see where she would be saying that because first of all, you know, you, you, you know how it is. You go to the store and they be playing Motown and you just automatically start singing because you know it's Motown and you know every word to the song, you know, but you're walking through the store. You're not doing anything to anybody. And, 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 and if you're, you, you're singing the song or whatever, and you maybe you'll start to dance and maybe you had your child with you and they were dancing and doing whatever. The perception, and this is not to say everybody's perception would be that, most people would look at it and go, oh, that's nice, they're dancing, it looks like fun or whatever, but they keep on going on about their business. You know, but you got store security looking at you. I used to work in retail, so I know I know all about this. Okay. <laughs> you got store security looking at you because in their mind they're going, okay, they could be causing a distraction so that they can rob us. So follow them. Whereas they're looking at her as, okay, here's this crazy white woman who ain't dressed up. I don't know why she ain't dressed up and she in the middle of the store dancing. It doesn't cross their mind that they could also be shoplifters. Right. And I think that's the distinction. So it becomes here, right? this, because it's, we're, it's we the micro, really it's the, Right. It's the microaggression of the shame, the extra layer, I'm going to call this the extra layer of shame and vulnerability that the society tries to place on us. Right. And this book I is, think... a, and this book is, I, because I started reading it today because I just got it today. This book is more, it's, yes, there's that shame and there's that vulnerability. And then there's that extra pressure that we live under as people of color. And then there's our resilience and how we move through that, which takes a lot of effort. We take yeah. a lot of effort to make it look effortless that we're moving through this extra layer that we have to deal with in addition to being human. Right. In the intro, is. she talks about, she said, I've shopped with enough friends to know that if I'm not dressed up, even if I was dressed up and I was in a department store with my black daughter broken to dance, there would be a whole other set of variables. So she's been with black friends in the store before and, and she knew that if I'm not dressed up, even if I, I am dressed up and I was in a department store, there would be a whole other set of variables to consider. Right. Um, which is what EJ is naming too, like the, those variables. Um, I, think I also, think, well, I also think the store. It's. I mean, she goes. She's very careful to name the store Nordstrom's, which is kind of on an upscale. It would be looked at differently than, say, if she were walking through Target. So there's there's also the extra mental being aware of what environment she's in when she's doing it. Absolutely. Now, and I you also that think that this is just like, you know, she's talking about reflecting, right? Whereas for, I think like brown and black people, we're constantly aware of this in the moment. Yes, absolutely. There's, there's the luxury of reflection doesn't occur. To, and I, that's what I was alluding to before, kind of like, oh, I don't even think about those moments of reflection that folks are in in order to get to that point. I think um, everyone here has touched on something that is very important. It does depend on the type of environment that we're in, okay? And I, I guess I'm talking from my own personal experience because I'm gonna to reveal to you now, I've done security work for a very long time. And I'm actually the person that manages the CCTV system at my corporation. You know what the CCTV system is, the closed circuit 
camera yeah. system. Yeah. And I, I, I'm going to be on. Yes, there are certain people that we will follow. Okay. And the public is not even half aware of how many times they are being followed by that system. Okay. So, um, and, and it, it, it's not fair. No, it's not a fair game. Okay. And, um, and all of us know that there are stereotypes involved with why we follow a certain person and why we don't follow another person that might be doing the very same thing. Okay. So I am going to reveal a harsh reality. EJ, you were absolutely right. And I'm going to be honest with you. I, when I go to the store in my neighborhood, which is an ethnic neighborhood, and they're playing music because they do play music that is ethnic to our culture, interesting enough, in my neighborhood. And many of us are in there kind of dancing and bopping around and everything and, and don't think anything of it. But, but if I go to a mall that's in a different neighborhood, would I become conscientious? And I, it, would I freely be dancing to them? The answer is no. I'm just not comfortable in that environment to do that. Okay, so, and I don't think I'm the only one who feels that way. See what I'm saying? They might do something, they might not, but I just don't feel need to take that chance. Okay, so it, it, it's not a fair game, all right? It is uh, something that no one is ever gonna be really comfortable to even admit, I will say. But thanks for listening to me, everyone. No, thank you, RG, for sharing and for naming that. I think what you're saying is that we've all had to, not, I think, you know, Thank you for naming the truth in your job and what that looks like. And it's no surprise to us, you know, like we all have had to navigate that. We've been on the other side of it. I'm sure no one here is a stranger necessarily to the idea of being targeted while shopping at this point in the game, right? Or at least a stranger to the notion that folks in community and folks around you have been targeted. So naming that real truth, what you're saying is like, we're, we literally navigate that. Right. And you saying, oh, maybe if I was in another neighborhood, that's absolutely true. We've all had to be in those choices. So I thank you for sharing that. I give praise, y'all. So, give, you know, if you have a visual, send a little love to RG's box. Thank you, RG. Come, we're in as much intellectual love as we are in physical love. So thank you. I appreciate the gems. Send some love that way. If you like what someone's saying, there's also a way to like silently clap. You could digitally clap. I've seen that emoji before. Feel free to participate. If we were in a circle, y'all would be humming off of each other's energy. So I want us to try to still be in that space. So something else that's touched upon in this that folks keep bringing up is vulnerability. And I'm really curious. And using a little bit of what we've read so far and from your understanding, let's get on the same page. Like, what is vulnerability? What is that? What is it to you? It could look like something. It could smell like something. What is vulnerability? Showing your full self. Showing your full self. What else? Transparency. Transparency. Mm -hmm. I think no. a part of it, a part of it is showing the parts that either societally or in our families or in our cultures we're not supposed to share, like that we've taught been taught not to share. And so mm. that's when I think of vulnerability. Um, the parts we've been taught not to share and, and sharing them. Yeah, sharing, sorry, yeah. Sharing the parts we've been taught not to share. Totally, yeah. Yeah. Know that in the early, the reading that we had to do, um, Tanya, Tanya, Denise, forgive me, I'm blanking on her last name, and Kesey are both being really vulnerable in their telling of their, you know, 
the issues with Tanya. Uh, she's dealing, you know, issues dealing with men and she's being vulnerable with, with Keith. He's talking about, you know, being vulnerable to the medical system and, and how that kind of affects, you know, who he is and how he navigates through the, through the world as it does with Denise, she, she is, um, you know, she is under sexual violence, physical violence. Um, she is in a community that isn't as welcoming as she would like or isn't as um, organized maybe as she would like. So they are both like really expressing levels of openness and vulnerability that I guess like in our normal lives, we're, we're not, we don't access from other people, um, you know, on a regular basis, unless that person is really, you know, family or intimate with us. And here we have people, I mean, they're writers, um, but still that, that level of vulnerability is really um, like, you know, insightful. Yeah. And something I'm thinking about, Ron, because you said you're naming that they're being vulnerable with each other. And I saw in our chat, someone shared a definition of vulnerability, meaning allowing someone, right, into your deepest self, having your guards down, but sharing that vulnerability with each other. So that's a sense of vulnerability. But then you actually use the word vulnerable, which is the way they described, like being vulnerable to the Medicare system. Mm -hmm. What... Are we only vulnerable in relationship to other people? What, like, where else does vulnerability lie? I think I'm asking us to question here. What else can vulnerability capture and encapsulate? Is it just when you're able to be in that self-defense? Oh, uh, Portia, did I say it right? Yeah, that was perfect. <laughs> um, I mean, I think vulnerability has a lot of different layers. You know, uh, I think we've often associated it to the the self or the relationship aspect of it but if we break it down like you can be vulnerable in human or social interactions you can be vulnerable in physical situations you can be vulnerable economically and also in like your cultural uh, environment like there are so many layers to vulnerability that um, are often uh, taken outside of ourselves but that are not typically acknowledged right why do you think, why, and this is not just for Porsche, this is for all of us, but why, why does that feel like less of acknowledgement? Because when I first thought of the word vulnerability, I did think in relationship to like maybe someone else as opposed to the systems that we navigate. Why do we think that those other forms of vulnerability are less acknowledged? Because they're typically uh, not in your control. And I feel like the ones where we're talking about being vulnerable in relation to other people, it's usually voluntary vulnerability where you're choosing, you're being intentional and in wanting to open a piece of yourself up. Whereas the other ones, they are out of your control, you know, mm. being black and being at the mercy of the medical industrial complex, being black and being at the mercy of the prison industrial complex and all these other systemic issues. It is not a choice. It is something that you are made vulnerable. Whereas the other ones, it is more intentional. And I think it would be, I think if we thought about all of those vulnerabilities, we would be, we, it would be paralyzing. You mm. wouldn't want to walk outside your house. But I also wonder too, how much of it is like, there's us and our relationship to systems of power um, and oppression, but there's also those systems relationship to us. And so part of the way that they continue to exist though is by, us having a really limited relationship with them or awareness or engagement with them. And so it's like, if we were encouraged to really think about the vulnerability that we experience on a day-to-day -day with all of those systems, yes, we might be, we might feel hopeless and helpless. And I think that's a piece of it, but we also might feel catalyzed to change it. Like if we really thought within community about the depths of it all, then that could also produce something different. And so I think that there's also a way that the systems are like, especially when I think about class, and capitalism, like it's really trying to tell you, oh, you're this independent person, you got it, you're fine. You're not vulnerable. Because if you if you tapped into that, there is a power in it um, that I think could challenge systems. Absolutely. 
So we're naming sort of like, we, we don't, we don't want to be bogged by them, but also being grounded in them in a certain way kind of helps us navigate them, right? It's, it's weird how both are true, not weird, but it's wonderful, I guess, how both are also true at the same time, given the way that we're going to be able to have to navigate the, these essays together, right? So I'm happy y'all brought that up. Any other thoughts around vulnerability? I mean, I think um, just social conditioning has a lot to do with it too. Um, the way that we were taught vulnerability from our parents, grandparents, great grandparents, aunts, uncles, family, um, and what it means to be um, vulnerable um, in your own home, uh, opposed to in relation or relationship to uh, another party or another like uh, pillar of society. Um, and we already know for, for Black people, like we are taught that vulnerability is something that you don't do. You don't, you don't show face, um, no matter what the situation is, no matter what the circumstance is too. Right. And to be vulnerable is almost a somatic experience, meaning you, it has to, it's the physicality of it almost. You feel it inside of you oftentimes. Right, right. And there are so many different associations with vulnerability. Like if you're vulnerable, then you're a sissy or you're too feminine or, you know, you're not man enough and us not wanting to be attached to those associations. Um, even though vulnerability um, is a, a natural and humanistic part of our, our physical state. Right. I think that also that we're also so much in survival mode that we don't give ourselves the opportunity to be vulnerable at all. You know, and I think this work really kind of, it captures the vulnerability and it allows you to, it creates a space for connection where you're able to see you in some of the stories. Mm -hmm. I know because some of the stories when I was listening to them had me boohooing because I felt it like on a, on a very deep level. And, and I may have not had the words to, you know, um, to name those things or like to share like the experience, but it's definitely something that certain things that I've, I've definitely felt on a visceral level. Willie, thank you. Because then the question that I guess I would pose or name to us as community is then what does vulnerability and black body feel like? What does that feel like then? If, if we're saying that through these various systems, right, that it essentially, wow, we're getting a lot of people in the Zoom. So sorry about the, if you guys hear the beeps. Uh, essentially, we have an entire group or a community of folks whose society has not created room for that expression, right? We're on survival mode. So what does it then feel like? And maybe I pose directly, what does it feel like to you? It's painful. <laughs> right, I would say painful. It feels it hurts. Like anxiety provoking. It's, yeah, it's um, hard. Restless, <laughs> it's your mind racing. It's yeah. thinking, having like this awareness, right? Like, um, um, who is it? WB Du Bois talks about like the, the double consciousness, uh, right? Nice. Like being aware of like my experience, but then how um, the other views my experience. You know, and then having to be vulnerable in that space of what does that feel like and look like, right? Because I don't know if I want to be vulnerable among right. It's people. not just sharing, but then it's like hyper aware that you're sharing. Hyper vigilance is is what comes to mind, is that we are always we're we're always operating at a certain level. We never really shut shut off, especially once we step outside our door. So invulnerability is a hyper vigilance. Yeah, and then realizing that like that kind of like space of home is within yourself. And a lot of us are not even at home or can't be at home. Mm. Yeah, I think another part of that is um, uh, feel, feeling what our, our fellow black and brown people are also going through too and feeling their, their stories of vulnerability and what those experiences have been like, like for them. Like when I read Tanya's story, it was almost like I was experiencing that pain and that trauma in my own body. 
along with generations and generations of other Black women um, who've gone through those very, very similar experiences. Um, so it, 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 there's definitely this, this closeness that is felt, you know, when I'm, I'm hearing about others of vulnerability, even though, you know, we, we may have been birthed from two different tribes. Yeah, Tanya's story was so amazing, I felt. Um, just like, because she calls in, like, into, like, she puts a lot of things into the forefront of things where we see things as, like, you know, being catty or being, but knowing that these are, like, deep-rooted issues that, you know, that these systems have in place for us to hate each other, to hate ourselves, but, you know, we just, like, pass it off as just, like, oh, low self-esteem, but no, this is something that's been, like, you know, really passed down and, stuff that we've eaten up and internalized yeah and I almost wonder like if we can theorize on what where vulnerability started like did it did it start with us you know because the dominant culture did they ever really have to be in a vulnerable like place or state um, whether it be uh, emotionally financially you know uh, economically you know they they are in a completely different category on their own but it, it it almost feels like vulnerability kind of started with our our people and this this lack of safety this lack of empathy and this lack of care that we've all experienced that forced us into this this space of um, being vulnerable yeah for sure when you especially if you think about dominant culture within and especially in order to become dominant culture or to maintain dominant culture you've had to have had your own sense of vulnerability. So seeing what's already been inflicted upon and then being in a position of power to inflict it upon others, I think you're touching something there. And like, where does vulnerability then really come from when we try to connect it to our bodies, right? Particularly in a non-white body. So I, I appreciate that, thank you. And also just want to add that vulnerability is oh, yes. coming from uh, this uh, hyper-visibility as well. So it's the hypervisibility of Black people being exposed from the auction block to today of the hyper surveillance and policing of today. It's been written about extensively. I couldn't cite all the authors at once right now, but it is that hypervisibility where it it's not, doesn't allow you vulnerability if you are constantly on display without a right to not only your body, but to a private life. It's just entirely in public. And that's just the concept of what it is to be, to be Black is from when you when the ships first came to America's shores to today's modern policing, it's just constant exposure. So it does not allow one to be comfortably vulnerable. Or at least then have to create multiple layers and definitions of vulnerability to therefore navigate. What, what do other folks think of that? I'm trying, to wrap my, I'm, trying to wrap my head the I'm trying to wrap my head around the concept of being comfortably vulnerable. Because <laughs> I think when you choose vulnerability, like let's go back to the romantic self real quick and put ourselves in the romantic sense, especially for those of us that are in, in black or brown body, right? Put yourself in the romantic sense of vulnerability. You're trying to be vulnerable with someone. I want to go to Barbara's definition because it's beautiful and I want to put it in my vows. Vulnerability, allowing someone into your deepest self guards down, right? Um, I, I think of that in a romantic sense. It could exist in many senses, but just ride the wave with me. Think of romantic partnership. Think of being in a choice as to whether or not you get to engage in vulnerability with that person. That's being accountable and being comfortable in your vulnerability. Now, take the romantic sense out of it and put yourself in the black body. You don't get that choice, right? We don't get that choice. Right. So, but, but what we're naming is that then in black people, we then have to have many versions of vulnerability. We have to have mm -hmm. our romantic sense. We compartmentalize. We then exist you know, in navigating, driving down the street sense, right? Versus being at work, versus being in book club, versus you know, all of the verses of life. So with that understanding, EJ, now tell me what you think. What's are, we ever, are we ever really comfortably vulnerable? No, it's exhausting. 
Yeah, I, I don't think we're ever really come. I mean, I, I had started reading it, and I forget which author it was that was talking about the, uh, the second one who was had the, the circle with the women and the women were saying, I'm going to take the cross country trip and I'm afraid right. to go because, you know, and I, my child, every time they walk, every time my husband and my son walk out the door, I'm afraid they're not gonna come back. I mean, so are we ever really comfortable, comfortably vulnerable? Because I mean, I, I could relate to a lot of the stuff that was that I had read so far. Because I've had those feelings, like my daughter leaves the house. Oh God, is she coming back? You know, it's going to be the car accident or what? You know, we're running to the police or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So it's yep. like, am I ever really comfortable? You know, I've actually experienced a a a a a, a black mother saying she doesn't she she tried not to love her sons too much because she was afraid that when they went out the door, they weren't gonna come back. So are we ever really comfortably vulnerable? Which I think EJ has given us a little thing to hold in mind, right? Are we comfortably vulnerable? Is, can we, cons can we even consider those moments actual vulnerability? which, wow, I just saw that Barbara said that. Barbara, I see you, I feel you. You know, it, is it? And I think these essays also bring that into question. And that's why we pose the question, what is vulnerability? What does it feel like? Because I don't know if we can know really what it is. But I'm curious for us as we read these stories, if we're able to engage in what that vulnerability feels like, what it looks like. You know, what's interesting, Paula, is I think about the story about, from Jason Reynolds, right? Yes. And he had like that moment, right, where he was like vulnerable, where he's like, he wanted to put himself first, right, instead of his mother, um, even though she was going through this procedure, and how that, that then turns into shame that he carries. Right, a little more. Continue. So it's like so it's like this shame that we experience, I feel, as black and brown folks for put it as putting ourselves first. There we go. So even when you try to be at your most vulnerable self, that sense of shame still exists. So and you're aware of it, right? Because it'd be different if you weren't, right? It'd be different you'd be able to be in that and not be. Yeah, because you see, even from what he was saying, it's like that shit sat with him like mm -hmm. all those years. And his mother's like, you have to let it go. Mm -hmm. But it's something that constantly replays in our head because we don't want to let um, our family down or the people that love us down, you know? And right. sometimes we have to, right? In order to put ourselves first, like we have to let people down. In order to prioritize. And I, and I would name that it's appropriate that none of us really have a solid answer because I think particularly in the black and brown body, to speak of vulnerability is to name where we're all trying to get to, which is the space of freedom, the space of liberation. Like once, once you feel like you're able to be in that, whatever that looks like for you and your individual, you will know vulnerability in a sense. And I think it's appropriate to name that we're all still in that, you know, and that's powerful when you think about it. Um, I want to share some thoughts that are in the chat. Uh, Barbara names, you know, when we're speaking of vulnerability, we're speaking of the self self unquote, which many of us can see that as a like individualized sense of self. But I also think when we think of the sense of self, it's interconnected. It's interdependent on all the systems that then make us look at ourself. And that's why vulnerability gets tricky because you try to keep it in an internal sense, but there are so many factors that affect it, you know? Um, and I want to name um, Kimberly's uh, naming I think another piece of it is being vulnerable with yourself first and foremost, honest with yourself, accepting of yourself, giving yourself grace. Shouldn't our vulnerability be about us and meeting our needs in a way that isn't dependent on others or validating or matching that vulnerability, if that makes sense, which it totally does, right? It should, and which is also the sum of what Barbara's naming. Vulnerability, if we're the only ones who can really shift it, it should only depend on ourselves, but we're naming that in the black body, all of these external systems affect it. 
Do these two notions counter each other, do you think? Or do you think they're, they're a result of one another? <laughs> you know, I know you like that question because I just came up with it on the spot. No, but truly, does the notion of vulnerability, sorry, let me, does the notion of vulnerability having to do with oneself versus the systems around you, are those two things like opposites? Or are those two things products of one another? What do y'all think? No wrong answers. You know this. Can you repeat your, your question? Yes. We're naming, um, in, the, in the last two comments and sort of what we've been naming in these last five or 10 minutes has been that vulnerability, you know, it, it feels like an individualized process. It feels like something that happens to oneself. When you think about allowing yourself to be vulnerable, that's something that you have to do. But we're naming that in the Black body, there are so many systems that affect how one shows up in oneself. So what I'm asking is, are these two things counter ideas or are they results of one another? Is vulnerability truly just something that's dependent on yourself? Or is it a result of the things around you? And I'm, I'm asking us to just guess what we think, you know? Let's see. I think they coexist at the same time. Talk to me. I mean, your, your vulnerability of yourself is something that you, that you can, that you can decide to work on, but the externals, you could decide to work on them, but that would take a lot to change it. So you, so, you know, both things can be the same, can be true at the same time. You could be working to try and change the external, how the external views you so that you're not so vulnerable in that sense, but that takes a lot of work to do that. And, but your, yourself, you can, you can sit down and be introspective with yourself and decide that you're not going to accept whatever it is that relates to the self, the same way that the, the woman who, who was, you know, with the, to made, where she made the bad choices with the men or whatever. And, the, you know, it's that one thing that she hit that wall talking to that cop that could have gave a shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she was like, I'm not doing this anymore. Right. And so that, and then in that sense, she could, she took control of her, she took control of her situation, even if it took her five years to actually get what she felt was the full control. But she started making different decisions because at that moment, it clicked to her that, wait a minute, I don't have to deal with this. Right. And literally found her voice and said it. And right. literally found her voice. And if you, when you want to, when you find your voice, then you have a, you, you gain a, a, a power that you didn't realize you had. And some people take, some people have to grow into their power and other people know it from the beginning and, all, and know how to use it. But for the most part, I think a lot of people have to actually grow into their sense of power. That it's not a frightening thing to realize that you have a power that makes other people uncomfortable. But what, and can we can we argue how tedious it is that in the black body we always gotta before being in your power you gotta fight first that you have a sense of power and that people aren't gonna like it and then you get to be in it. What do folks right. think about that? Is that notion tired for some of us? I often sometimes go to things and I see people like oh the story of resiliency and it's my generation you know I won't lie I'll be accountable I'm, I'm no longer 92 I get it 32 in the room it's my generation that's like oh the story of resiliency is and this is not everyone but sort of this overarching idea that like the black story shouldn't just be that of resiliency and what else would it look like so I name for you then when we claim power right that's part of the exhaustion because it's like, yo, I can't just be powerful. I have to now 
ground myself in the fact that not everyone around me is comfortable with my power. I have to be in that sense. Does everyone get to navigate power that way? No, I feel like maybe that's only non-white folks, you know? What do y'all think? Or anything else that's coming to mind? But what about these external powers that make us vulnerable, like the violence that, you know, women face or black people face that we, that we as the victim can't, can't rationalize. We can't, we can't like self-examine ourselves and make it easier for you to believe your son or daughter or whoever can leave the house and be safe. Um, you know, in the case of Tanya Fields, yeah, she might be, you know, really empowered, you know, to change her life, but she's still vulnerable to sexual violence. Um, you know, Kesey Lehman, he, he may be reckoning, you know, with his own personal issues, but he still fears medical violence against him. And I'm not sure if that sort of self-reflection, I mean, and Kesey's, I mean, well, no, not really, but, uh, you know, I don't know if self-reflection can change that, that, you know, trying to better ourselves and admit our own vulnerabilities will make Keith less, less fearful of the medical system or make, you know, make someone less fearful of the, the, the um, police system that we live under. So it feels like there's something that you can control and there are other things that you cannot control that leave us equally vulnerable. So you pose, you pose a great point, Ron, because then I wonder, right? Is, does, is it not, and this is for everyone, not for Ron only, is it enough of an impact that can, is impact enough or does it have to completely change, right? Like naming your power, being in a space of power, is it enough to just say that impact and be, you know, it, yeah, you're right. It doesn't change the fear of perhaps medical abuse that Kiese may carry with, with him, right? But does naming that impact how he sees himself in that story? Which you're right, isn't a complete solution. Is it not just as important? Is the question I pose. Paula, Paula, you know I love saying your name aloud because I never get to. Paula sharing that they, the personal and system, seem frighteningly intertwined, right? Systems make personal mm -hmm. even worse and prohibit healing. And I want to repeat that line. Systems make personal shame even worse and prohibit healing. But as EJ said, that external shaming can provoke refusal and voice, and that insight can be personally healing. But Ron's point that you still have to walk out the door to a damaging world remains, right? So we're saying that like, maybe these systems are more related as opposed to countering each other. And naming them can create a change but that change doesn't really, it's not enough. You still got to be Black in the world. And you still got to be navigating things around you. That right, because I feel thought. like, I feel like um, you know, we can do the work, right? But we still, like Ron said, have to go out and exist in this world where I can show my vulnerability all day. That doesn't mean the police officers are going to shoot me. Period. Mm -hmm. And you can be in a deep power around it, right? And it'll still happen. And it's happened. And then because you do show vulnerability, it's almost, um, I've seen it perceived as like an arrogance. Definitely. We definitely see vulnerability used as a tool against Black bodies and named as arrogance and then using that as an excuse to therefore have violence inflicted upon us for sure. And we see that in medical systems and the medical system and our policing systems and our schools. Think about how many young people, we have a lot of educators in the space 
a lot of parents in the space. Think about how many young people, how many times you've had to advocate for the children in your family, or how many young people don't have that sense of advocacy because they're not seen that way, right? They're seen as troublemakers or they're seen as difficult. So I appreciate that. Well, they, they don't even have to be, but they, they don't even have to be seen as troublemakers or difficult and they still face. You know, they could be they could be brilliant, and they and they'll turn and and the system will turn around and tell them they're stupid. Well, that's what I'm saying, and, and drum it into their head until when, they until they become a self fulfilling prophecy. That's what that's what I'm naming exactly. Linda, you were saying something. I was going to say sometimes they're just simply not seen at all. It it doesn't matter. They're they're right. just seen. They're invisible. Absolutely. So we see this, we see this constantly in the navigation of life. I want to name real quick because I just glanced at the time. Ooh, time flies when you're getting smart and you're having fun. I want to name with our last 10 minutes that next week's readings, we're just saying it aloud, mostly to get everyone on the same page, but mostly to get me on the same page because we do these sessions twice a week. Uh, pages 54 to 108. If you have a physical copy of the book, if you're on a Kindle or a different device, Godspeed, I have no clue what pages those are, but pages 54 to 108, the chapters, I'm going to read them aloud, are The Wisdom of Process by Prentice Hemphill, Love Lifted Me, Subverting Shame Narratives and Legitimizing Vulnerability as a Mechanism for Healing Women in the Black Church by Tracy Michael Lewis Giggitz. Then there's Never Too Much by Mark Lamont Hill. We Are Human Too on Blackness, Vulnerability, Disability, and the Work Ahead by Kia Brown. What's in a Name by Luvia J.E. Jones. The Blues of Vulnerability, Love and Healing Black Youth by Sean A. Jinright. So those are the chapters, make sure you mark them. At least if you heard them aloud, you will you may recognize them on paper. That's a scientific fact proven to be true. I don't know if you know that, that if you've heard something aloud before you've actually read it, you'll recognize it. I don't know, I'm not a scientist though. I just saw it on Buzzfeed. So with eight minutes remaining, um, I do, I have another question that I wanna pose to the group, but actually let's go to Barbara's question, which is, yeah, good question. How does vulnerability show arrogance? And I think she's referring to when we were talking about uh, earlier naming that sometimes if you're sh being shown vulnerability, it's being seen as arrogant. And Willie, I won't speak for you, but I'm going to assume that you were naming in that example, like if you were to get arrested, if you're being vulnerable with a police officer, they use it against you. They're like, you're being arrogant. You're talking back. Yeah, you're so if you have some compliant. kind of, or if you, or if you have some kind of, um, self-awareness right due to the vulnerability then that's also perceived as being arrogant or being mouthy right look what happened to um oh goodness elijah um what is elijah i forget his last name from colorado young man that had uh asperger's disease real deep sense of self-awareness and tried to explain literally his neurological disorder to the police and was murdered you know so I think when we even when we think about like that sense of self uh and just having to name that and say that can be used against you in so many ways and in systems against us and I think that's why vulnerability is hard and we're gonna also curate another layer that this is not necessarily stories or an anthology of vulnerability being curated or created by cis have men necessarily, right? But we have women who are working in this and understanding what is the lens and that sense of protection and what is what is the underlining thread, right? What are what is the actual point that these women are trying to get us to understand as we go through these essays? You can answer it now, you can answer it later. But I'd be curious for us to explore what that thread is.
And with what, what I thought what was interesting was um the one the lady who spoke about um you know foreboding joy and um something that she said that I kept rewinding back was when she was saying like rehearsing tragedy, you know, and how how often we have to do that. Speak because more to that. We, because we wait for the other shoe to drop, right? We can't be comfortable. Things can't be good for too long because you know something's gonna happen. Absolutely. And uh, this is also that when we talk about arrogance, in this sense, I think I'm looking at the whole perspective of the type of circumstance that causes that arrogance. And I think all of us automatically think of that social justice system, but it penetrates through every form of life, education, in the medical field, okay? You see what I'm saying? I think it becomes so much a part that it's easy for us to even think that it's the norm when it really is not, okay? I, I remember even as a child, um, an assignment of, of drawing a picture of who we thought had to, would be the president. This was in the fifth grade, I was 10 years old. A girl drew a picture and she colored it in brown and the teacher told her, listen, you stupid child, we're never gonna have a black president in the United States. What's the matter with you? See what I'm saying? And she literally speaking thought like that, cause I do this girl, she's the one that sat next to me. And, and when she asked the teacher why, she was told, oh, stop answering me back now. But I knew if she would have been a white child, she would have never been considered to be answering back. Okay, so that's just an example of how that arrogance just penetrates. Okay. Right. Sometimes things happen to us is what we're naming. Sometimes things happen to us and we have to be in that. And I mean, have you ever, have you ever been to a space? I don't, maybe not all of us are in this sort of personality. Have you, whether it's yourself or you've seen this person right? That's kind of like really open and vulnerable. And you may tell yourself, oh, wow, this person's doing a lot. Or, oh, wow, this person seems really comfortable. Or if it's you, you're like, oh, wow, I really am enjoying this space. Has that never been used against you? Or that lens has been misconstrued? Like, oh, they're a little arrogant. But maybe someone was just trying to get to know people in the space, right? Or someone was just trying to come around. So I think often, people act in their whole selves and then our perceptions and or what happens to them, how they're received in that, then create an area of arrogance. And I think when you're black, uh, it's tumultuous because you're probably not moving in that sense of arrogance. You're probably moving in a sense of just trying to navigate, right? I mean, we often see too, like the stereotype of the sassy black women. Think of all the tropes that we've had in Western culture and media within the last five, 10 years. All of them are sort of dependent, right? On folks being hyper-criticized in their, in their vulnerability. You know, if you someone shows up defensive, that's a sense of vulnerability. It's just like, oh, wow, this person is trying to protect themselves, even if they're not saying it, right? And I think often Black people also get put in that. I want to just acknowledge that Ron shared the New York Times article. I don't have a time subscription because it's money. But <laughs> <laughs> if you are living the high life, definitely read about Elijah McClain and sort of literally the article I believe this is the one where like they give the account, right, of what happened to him that day. And, and you kind of get to see how he's trying to explain who he is to these officers and it ends tragically. And I think it's something to keep in mind as we read through the book, just sort of what are our own interpersonal definitions of vulnerability? And by the end of the book, like, where does that leave us, right? How are we using that vulnerability? I think it'd be really great to explore.